I'm Roger Baker, Executive Director of the Stratfor Center for Applied Geopolitics at RAIN, a global center of excellence for geopolitical intelligence and analysis. Learn how you can put geopolitics to work for your organization at RAINnetwork.com. Hello and welcome to this episode of RAIN's Essential Geopolitics Podcast. I'm Emma Kami, and I'm here today with RAIN's Asia-Pacific analyst, Chase Blasick, to discuss Taiwan's upcoming January elections and their likely impact on relations with China and the U.S. Welcome to the podcast, Chase. Good to speak with you again. So to start us off, can you give us a, pre- a brief overview um, of these elections and your outlook for them? Yeah, sure thing. Uh, so these will happen on January 13th. These are presidential and legislative elections for Taiwan. Uh, although most of the news coverage you're seeing uh, is is all about the presidency, uh, and that matters because that dictates how how China treats Taiwan for the next four years. Um, but but first, just just focusing on the election itself, uh, we've got a three-way race. There was a failed uh, effort by the two opposition parties in Taiwan uh, to cooperate against the the ruling Democratic Progressive Party and by doing so, uh, have a better chance of combining their votes in beating the incumbent, uh, but they failed to negotiate some sort of uh, cooperation agreement. So now it's a three-way race with one incumbent and two opposition parties sort of splitting the opposition vote. Because of that, it's looking like it's more likely the incumbent, the the Democratic Progressive Party, which is more pro-sovereignty, sort of anti-China, pro-US in its outlook, it's looking like uh, their candidate, William Lai, will win the presidency, Um, although it's by no means a a one race. Uh, Depending on the polls, he's between three to five percent ahead of the the opposition sort of conservative pro-China party, uh, the Kuomintang or KMT, and there's still a good amount of undecided voters, so this uh, thing isn't over yet, Um, but it is looking like a DPP um, win for the presidency. As far as the legislature is concerned, uh, it's looking like the, the DPP, which currently holds a majority in the legislature, uh, will lose that majority. And there will either be a three-way split in the legislature between uh, the DPP, the KMT, and this centrist third party, uh, the Taiwan People's Party, or, or uh, TPP. Um, or, so a three-way split, or the KMT, this opposition conservative party, will win the legislature outright uh, with their own majority. Um, So we're headed toward one party winning the presidency and the other party winning the legislature, um, which has precedent. This isn't um, completely unusual uh, in Taiwanese history, uh, but that could make for some uh, eventful next, (laughs) next three or four years as the presidency and the the legislature could be at loggerheads with one another about various issues. Um, The the biggest issue on the ballot, of course, is China. That's the one that the whole rest of the world is talking about. And even within Taiwan, this is a major issue of of how the president is going to to interact with China. Will they be amicable and say, well, if we just interact better and more in a more friendly manner with China, there wouldn't be much of a risk of war. Or like the, the current president, will they say, no, we, we don't have to apologize for our sovereignty. We must, you know, boost national defense, our partnership with the U.S., even if that means a risk of war. What, what's our option? We have to defend sovereignty. So, so that's the main issue. But there's also, um, as with any election, local issues like the economy, um, housing, wages, and, and social issues to be considered here. Can you explain what are some of the immediate implications of this election, especially regarding China's reaction? Yeah, I'll, I'll take the less likely um, and easier to explain case first. So in the less likely situation, at least less likely right now, uh, that the opposition wins uh, and the, the KMT, this conservative pro-China party, um, wins the presidency, the things will be considerably less tense than they have been in the last few years, uh, in the last eight years, actually, between China and Taiwan, with, with fewer uh, cases of economic and diplomatic coercion. I'm thinking, you know, import bans uh, on, on Taiwanese goods, that sort of thing, and generally less military coercion, too, like the, the military drills we've seen around Taiwan in August 2022 and April 2023. Um, that said they're unlikely to win right now, this, this opposition KMT party. So in the more likely case where the DPP wins again, 
uh, what we would see is a continuation of this trend of building military pressure around Taiwan, where China's trying to do a number of things, uh, trying to, to signal with these you know, military drills and air incursions and, and all of this signal to the rest of the world uh, that, hey, if, if you think Taiwanese sovereignty is so important, just, just know you better be prepared to go to war for it. Uh, and doing the same thing to Taiwan, signaling to, to the leaders in Taipei that if you think sovereignty is so important, just know you're going to have to go to war against China and you will lose. Um, so that's sort of what they're trying to signal here, and that, that sort of coercion is going to escalate over, um, over the next few years. Um, but, but sort of in the immediate term, what we would see is uh, a potential of uh, a repeat of those drills from August 2022, which were live fire drills around Taiwan. They impeded some uh, shipping and air traffic around Taiwan, nothing major. Um, but there were folks, including myself, who saw this as a good dry run for a blockade where you, you, you block off certain shipping and air routes and you practice what it would be like to cut off Taiwan from, from key global trade. Um, also, immediately following the election uh, in January or inauguration in May, uh, China could cut off, uh, partially, I should say, partially revoke the Economic Cooperation Framework Agreement with Taiwan which is effectively a trade agreement uh, that removes tariffs on various goods. Uh, so this would raise, if they revoked this, it would raise tariffs on various Taiwanese goods, um, such as petrochemicals or textiles, but it would likely not do so for many Taiwanese electronics. And that's because China relies upon purchasing, the, purchasing those electronics too much. It, it needs them for, for China's own industrial development. And so it really wouldn't want to shoot itself uh, in the foot there. There's also a possibility that the, the U.S. elections come November 2024 are another sort of uh, trigger for Chinese action around Taiwan if the DPP wins uh, in January. And this would be in the form of, for example, another uh, major visit of, of a U.S. House member or House Speaker to Taiwan, just like Nancy Pelosi did in August 2022, which is what uh, triggered those original Chinese uh, live fire drills uh, of that same month. What are some of the longer term implications of this election beyond 2024? Yeah, well, as I started to hint at a little bit there in that previous answer, um, long term, Beijing will continue to up this pressure of the air incursions around Taiwan uh, more uh, in greater number, uh, but also in, in the size and, and variety of makeup of military assets in these drills around Taiwan. Um, and then long term, you know, looking at three or four years, there's the possibility that that China starts to take some, some limited kinetic action against Taiwan, such as uh, artillery shelling against the Kinmen or Matsu Islands, uh, mainly for, for the sake of um, intimidation, not for the sake of actually um, you know, replacing the government there, likely, um, or something like cutting off uh, internet to those, to those outer islands that are um, not really important to Taiwan's economy, but they're very close to China. There are Taiwanese citizens living there, and so they're very symbolic. Um, Long term, uh, if the DPP wins, like we're projecting um, in, in January, U.S.-China relations will also continue to, to deteriorate because China has made it uh, crystal clear that Taiwan is the most important issue. It is the foundation of China's relations with the United States and with every other country, which is to say, if a given country is not willing to, to concede to China's view on Taiwan, then we're going to have a problem, basically. Our relations are going to be poor for the foreseeable future. This is what the, the, the message that China gives. So given U.S.-China relations are, are already quite poor, um, uh, Taiwan being in, in, uh, in control of this Democratic Progressive Party, who is a, a U.S. partner, uh, would sort of uh, continue this trend. Um, on the opposite end, if, if the KMT uh, or the, the TPP, one of these two opposition parties, wins, um, even though there will be a honeymoon period for perhaps a year or two where there's greater uh, U.S. or pardon me, there's greater China-Taiwan uh, economic cooperation, uh, diplomatic cooperation. After a year or two, China will start expecting for the government in Taipei to, to reignite some, something like uh, political reunification negotiations where, hey, let's come to the table and talk about what a future of our two uh, areas, as China would put it, reunifying, would look like. And this would be where they, they run into trouble because the KMT or the TPP, these opposition parties, 
even if they are more friendly toward China, they are still ruled by their constituencies at home, and nobody in Taiwan wants to reunify with, with China. I shouldn't say nobody. These are single-digit percentages. And so they would, in the end, be unable to make any meaningful political concessions to China. And thereafter, it's likely that China would again resort to some manner of economic and military coercion against Taiwan, perhaps you know, after this one to two year honeymoon period. And we'd again see this, this slowly building pressure in, in China-Taiwan relations, but of course, uh, to a lesser degree than if the uh, ruling DPP wins. Thanks for that analysis. Uh, just one quick question, I guess, in the short term, is there also a chance of China getting involved and kind of meddling in these upcoming elections? I mean, you touched upon them trying to sway voters in a certain direction, but is it possible that it could go deeper than that to actual like misinformation campaigns and et cetera? Yeah, I think swaying the election um, is, is more um, to the point or is more accurate, as you were saying. Meaning China is always going to to try and, and put quite a bit of money and effort into disinformation campaigns, into saying, you know, the DPP's bad, the KMT's good. Um, if you vote for the KMT, there will be no war. If you vote for the DPP, there will be war. Um, I was just reading something today that was quite fascinating, saying that basically those arguments are effective for people uh, who are undecided voters, which is a minority, but it's there's still a group of them. But for those who already know who they're going to vote for, they already have a party affiliation in Taiwan, they're considerably less effective. Um, so given this uh, election is a three-way split, um, and as I was mentioning earlier, um, a three-way party split, I should say, and as I was mentioning earlier, there's still a decent amount of undecided voters. Um, we'll see. Uh, we'll see just how effective China's um, influence campaigns are at convincing those undecided voters to, to vote for an opposition party. Um, traditionally, Taiwan tends to suggest, or I should say the Taipei government tends to suggest that over the last you know, three to four years, the government's gotten much better at combating these Chinese disinformation campaigns. Um, but it's, it's always an open question, and uh, we'll have to see what the, what the voters show. Well, I'm sure we'll hear more from you uh, when that happens. Thank you again, Chase. Yeah, of course. Thank you, Emma. If you're interested in more analyses from Rain, you can subscribe to our geopolitical intelligence product, Rain Worldview. Our suite of risk products allow clients to access the insights and analyses they need to make more informed decisions and drive better risk management outcomes. You can sign up or learn more at our website, rainnetwork.com. That's R-A-N-E network.com. I'm Emma Kami. Thanks for listening.